is <clears throat> talk about HIPAC a little bit so that you understand uh, a little bit more about the organization that's sponsoring this and also talk very briefly about uh, how computation is transforming astronomy since that's I think going to be the main thing that Mike Norman talks about in the talk after this which is the first of the uh, hour-long talks uh, 45 minutes of sort of presentation and uh, definitely 15 minutes left uh, for discussion so uh, I also should mention that all of the slides, in addition to the videos, uh, will be posted online very quickly. Uh, Nina, among other things, is our webmaster, and she'll be in charge of getting these things up very quickly. So don't feel you have to read all the text, but the key text is that as, compu as computing and observational power continue to increase rapidly, basically on Moore's law, uh, and a key point is that the ability to get large numbers of pixels and collect vast amounts of data in astronomy is increasing at least as fast as uh, the Moore's law, uh, you know, doubling every uh, year and a half increase in the amount of stuff we can put on chips. And uh, the memory, uh, the, the storage capabilities are increasing much more rapidly. So the most difficult problems in astrophysics, which were for many years beyond comprehension and uh, certainly beyond computation, are now coming within the realm of computational possibility. The purpose of HIPAC is to realize the full potential of the University of California's world-leading computational astrophysicists, including those at the affiliated national laboratories, which are Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Livermore National Lab, and Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, and one of the uh, speakers in this program, uh, Brenda Dingus, is from Los Alamos. Uh, several of us are also affiliated with uh, one or both of the other two labs. Uh, so in addition, HIPAC has engaged from the beginning in uh, major outreach activities. More on that at the end. This is the leadership of HIPAC. Uh, so I'm the director, and then there's a Northern and Southern California coordinator. The Northern California coordinator is Peter Nugent, who was also the co-director of last summer's uh, HIPAC summer school. The Southern California coordinator is Mike Norman, who is also the director of the San Diego Supercomputer Center and will be the host of this summer's summer school. The council is representatives from all of the UC campuses and except for the medical school in San Francisco and uh, the three DOE laboratories. And you just met the other members of the HIPAC staff. Uh, this is probably not of interest to you because these are not funding opportunities for journalists. They're funding opportunities for faculty at the University of California and uh, scientists at the labs. Uh, but I just wanted you to be aware that we have uh, cycles of funding. We're supporting a number of undergraduates doing senior theses this summer. We did last summer. Uh, we do all that sort of stuff, especially travel between the campuses uh, on scientific projects. The idea is to make the University of California, which is a bunch of separate great universities, act more as a single unified uh, university from the point of view of uh, bringing people together across the different campuses, which mostly compete with each other, as well as with all other universities. Uh, so the summer schools, the uh, conferences. So uh, the first of our conferences was actually held at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Uh, it was called the Future of Astrocomputing. Uh, this was a summer school that was held, uh, actually, sorry, this is a, a conference that was held here last summer. Uh, and this was held just uh, about a block that side of this room. And uh, we just had uh, a conference called the Baryon Cycle at the Beckman Center at UC Irvine. That was, uh, I guess, about a week ago. And uh, we have uh, several more coming up this summer. And uh, we're already planning for next year. So we have quite an active schedule. Uh, this was the summer school that was held here in 2010 on galaxy simulations. So that was the first of our summer schools when HIPAC just started at the beginning of 2010. So that was summer of 2010. Uh, the 2011 summer school uh, was at Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and it was on uh, explosive astrophysics. Supernovae, gamma ray bursts, all that sort of thing. 
Uh, this summer, it's on astroinformatics, the big data problem in astronomy. Uh, and we're having it at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, uh, partly because the San Diego Supercomputer Center hosts uh, amazing new machine called the Gordon supercomputer, as in Flash Gordon. Uh, this was uh, Mike Norman's brainchild. He was the PI. And, uh, it's the first computer to have a huge flash memory, 300 terabytes. It's about 100 to 1,000 times faster than disk, because with disk, you have to wait till the disk rotates so that you, your read head is over what you want to read, and then you can only read at the speed the disk turns. So. This is going to enable completely new uh, sorts of searches of vast astronomical databases uh, where you're combining information about different kinds of galaxies in different locations and comparing, for example, to theoretical predictions. And when you have tens of terabytes of this kind of data, uh, the only way that it's been accessible before is to put it on a, a rapid disk array that's associated with your supercomputer. But if you can speed that up by a factor of 100, what took a week to do will take an hour. It'll be a complete change. And, uh, and the students will all have accounts on that machine. We're going to load up some of the uh, flash with the best astronomical databases. And the lecturers, of course, are going to be leaders in this field, uh, people who created uh, many of these databases, both for theory and for observation. Uh, Alex Zale, who's the director from Johns Hopkins University, uh, created the Sloan Digital Sky Survey database, working uh, with Jim Gray, uh, the late Jim Gray of Microsoft. <laughs> now, uh, briefly, uh, what are the challenges in high-performance astrocomputing? There are basically two, big data and changing computers. Uh, this is just a single example of the sort of big data issues that we deal with. So what this is, is the record of downloads, quarter by quarter, I think, uh, from the IPAC server. So that's the infrared uh, database, the uh, NASA Infrared Science Archive is the official name, uh, which is hosted at Jet Propulsion Labs and Caltech. And uh, this just shows you the amount of stuff. This is. Uh, terabytes downloaded per month. Uh, and this ends sometime in 2011, just as the WISE data, the Wide Field Infrared Space uh, uh, Explorer uh, data started to come in. So uh, the first all-sky survey in the infrared was with uh, the Infrared Satellite Observatory. And uh, it was a single pixel instrument. Uh, WISE is a uh, forget how many million pixel instrument. It is the entire sky in several different infrared wave bands. All of that data is now available and it's being downloaded very rapidly. And that's an example of th the WISE data was just starting to come in. That's uh, the Spitzer is, is red. That was the previous still operating uh, leading infrared satellite. Uh, but as the WISE data comes in, this thing is going to shoot up to the roof. This is happening all across astronomy, and of course in many other areas as well. The other thing that's happened, and, and uh, the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, an approved project, uh, it's being built in Chile. It's led by uh, Tony Tyson, a professor at the University of California, Davis, uh, with uh, involvement from many other UC campuses, including this one, and also many other universities around the world. Uh, it's going to be producing, uh, I think it says uh, 20 terabytes a night, the 30 terabytes a night. The final image archive will be 70 petabytes. Petabyte is 1,000 terabytes. Uh, and uh, it's going to basically be making a movie of the sky. Uh, it's going to be collecting data on the entire sky visible from the southern hemisphere every few nights. It'll discover thousands of supernovae, thousands of new supernovae every night. We've been getting about 100 a year. Now that's increasing, but nothing like 1,000 a night. So this is, yes? I just wonder, can you clarify by science archive downloads, is that data, data that people are actually using and 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's this is it's scientific downloads. Of course, it's open to the public. But yes, this is data in infrared astronomy that people are using all the time. How much more than that is the actual data that is being produced? Oh. Uh, I don't know what the, I mean, I actually had another graph that shows what the, the current archive is, but, uh, you know, it's probably tens of terabytes. Not, not that much right now. Maybe 100 terabytes. Uh, do you happen to remember what WISE is? Might be 100 terabytes. Also, uh, some people could be downloading the same thing. So. Yeah, sure. Although usually you, you, you wouldn't bother. You'd just put it on your local server. But the point is that this is nothing compared to what's coming down the pike in a few years. And this is, I mean, LSST is the most extreme example, but there's lots of new stuff that is coming in now. There's something called PanStars, uh, which is producing huge amounts of data in the northern sky. Uh, the other thing that's happening, in addition to the big data challenge, is that the nature of computers is changing. All computers, but especially high-performance computers, supercomputers, in other words. Uh, it used to be that what we had were basically single processor programs, things that you wrote to run on a single uh, processor machine. And then you learned how to spread those among a number of processors in what we used to call a cluster. You'd basically take a bunch of similar machines and hook them together. And you'd divide the work among them and uh, collect the data or, in, in a fairly simple way, share data between them. Modern supercomputers are designed in a completely different way. You have a combination of multi-core chips, chips that have many processors on them, and then often mixed in are special purpose computers, like the old Cray machines, that are what we call vector machines, that can do vector operations. For example, when you take a dot product of two vectors, you multiply the first item in one vector times the first item in the other vector, and then add that to the product of the second times the second, the third times the third, and so on. That's a vector operation. So there are these special machines called graphic processor units, which are originally designed for gamers and are built into all uh, PCs and laptops. But they're very super fast ones now that can do a huge number of these operations extremely quickly. And they're rather cheap. You can get what used to be a, a multi-tens of millions of dollars Cray machine. You can get the equivalent of that for $1,000 on a single board. And so these are very powerful machines, but they have to be programmed in a very different way from conventional computers. And then those are often mixed in with yet other special gadgets, which allow rapid communication, for example, among uh, different nodes. So the result is, that the new computers are really different and they're going to get more different. And the reason basically is that uh, the speed of the individual processors has stopped increasing. This is processor performance for individual processors and the inflection occurred around 2004. And if you had continued on the same trend, it used to be the reason that everything got faster and faster was that the individual processors were getting faster. But we're already 10 times off the trend in 2012. And in 2020, we'll be 100 times off that. Does that mean that they're getting slower? No, of course not. The reason for this is to save energy. The old machines, if you kept building them the same way, would use 10 times more energy than the new machines do. And soon, 100 times more energy. But computers are now using several percent of the entire energy that's generated, the electricity that's generated in the United States. We can't keep doubling and doubling and doubling. And so you have to change the design. Uh, this is the change in processor clock speed, which parallels this. The, the clock speeds are running about 3 gigahertz. They haven't much changed in the last uh, 10 years. And they aren't going to. We throw more cores in, but we have to use them more efficiently. So the challenges facing us are big data and changing high performance computer architecture. And yes? Is that something that needs to happen in order it's, to keep it, it going? Or is it, it is happening, okay. but what we need to do is learn how to use this new environment. And the problem is that most of the computer codes were written by scientists like me, or my graduate students more <laughs> typically. And, uh, the problem is that these new machines are really tricky. 
And you have to basically be a computer scientist to learn how to use them, or a computer engineer. And so what we need is to have a new sort of collaboration, new people trained to do this, who will work with the scientists. So uh, one of the things that I've been working on is uh, uh, developing a proposal. Uh, Trudy's telling me that uh, my time is up, and uh, I'm just about finished. Uh, a proposal to create uh, a new center for scientific computation that will address all of these challenges. Uh, Astrocomputing is prototypical scientific computing, but in astronomy we have several advantages over other areas. The data is clean. It's mostly non-proprietary. Uh, in fact, we usually make it public as quickly as possible. The research is mostly funded. The data is sexy. At least a lot of people think so. Uh, so 100,000 people have volunteered to uh, participate whoops, in this Galaxy Zoo project and classify galaxies. Uh, you'll hear about the transit search, uh, I think later today. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, lets people see the data as we get it on extrasolar planets and try to understand the nature of the extrasolar planetary systems. Greg Laughlin created this. He's one of our speakers. SETI at home. Uh, this is the sort of visualization uh, that we've done at HIPAC. We've uh, created shows, parts of shows for the California Academy of Sciences, the opening show for the new Adler Planetarium, uh, their 8,000 pixel across dome show, which opened last summer. And uh, I'm going to be working with the American Museum of Natural History. They're going to do a show for the first time, uh, it's supposed to come out in fall of 2013, on modern cosmology, dark energy, dark matter, and why you should believe all that. Uh, these are the sorts of things that we're making available to the public on our website. So think cosmically, act globally, eat locally. That's the motto and uh, a book that my wife and I uh, published last year, which has just come out in paperback. And uh, we were just told that it had won the uh, Nautilus Gold Award for the best science book of uh, the year. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is also that at this newuniverse.org, newuniverse.org, all of the illustrations and the dozens of videos that are associated with the book are all freely available for anybody to use. You may find stuff there that you like. And then also on the HIPAC website. Mm -hmm.